Hello, everyone. Well, who doesn't love a good mystery? Especially when they come in beige. And we have three such mysteries here. These all probably range from the early to mid-2000s. I don't know, I've been liking the 2000s lately. Well, let's tear into these. How could I not start with the AMD Athlon XP system? A CPU that's very dear to me. Got our memory card reader and floppy drive here. Here's our power and reset buttons. We have a DVD burner up here. And this is kind of odd. This is a CD burner that's also a DVD-ROM, but doesn't also burn DVDs? That seems almost unbelievable. I'm gonna have to see this for myself. That seems very strange to me. And the spot for the case badge is actually embedded in this drive blank here. That's an interesting way to do it. We've got some USB and audio ports on the side here. This case also has provisions for a firewire connection up there. Here's a look at the back. And what on earth is that? That's some kind of mesh over what must be a heat exchanger. It's weird that they put that right in the I.O. plate there. This machine's getting interesting. We also have onboard firewire there, four USB ports, onboard NIC, and a very interesting looking sound card. And with that video card having dual DVI outputs, that's definitely gotta be something interesting. We also have a modern-ish looking power supply there. This system must have been well loved. All right, let's get this thing open. This system also has a side case fan here. That's a must have for any serious mid 2000s machine. Whoa! Okay, that is not an AMD Athlon XP. That is a serious CPU cooler. <laughs> Just look at the size of that thing. All right, let's get this thing on the stand. Yeah, that CPU cooler is definitely something I would have been drooling over on Newegg back in the day. So this has to be a socket 939 system. And that is a heat exchanger on the I.O. plate. And it runs to the north bridge. Now that is fascinating. That little thing must get pretty toasty. And that video card looks pretty serious as well. This thing must have been somebody's gaming PC. And we even have the fancy red heat spreaders on the memory. Somebody had a lot of fun putting this thing together. It's really too bad it doesn't have the hard drive. Let's pull that thing out of there. Okay, that's definitely an NVIDIA card. Probably a GTX 9000 series or something. That is a serious heatsink. And it's PCI Express. Aha, yeah, it's a 9600 GT with 512 megs of DDR3 video memory. This is also something I would have been drooling over back then. We do have some discoloration on this area of the board here though, but that could be due to the VRM components on the other side. Let's just hope for the best. Let's put that to the side. And our PCIe locking tab came off, but luckily it didn't break. Let's get that back on. Good as new. So it looks like that sound card is some kind of special thing for this motherboard only. The silk screen says Audio Max 1. That sure looks like just regular PCI Express, but obviously in a very weird spot. Let's pull that thing out of there. Yeah, it sure looks like an inverted PCIe 1X slot to me. And the heart of it appears to be a Realtek ALC850. I am finding this kind of strange. Well, I guess that's one way to keep the motherboard versatile in terms of audio. Now I'm going to sit here and wonder if that's really a PCI Express 1X slot just flipped around. This thing's even new enough for SATA. It's getting a little modern in here. Let's clear these cables out. You know you're in for a treat especial when you see wire caps inside a computer. And that runs over to the case fan header with some very chopped up wires. And I guess they needed some extra USB. That thing's actually a separate card. I thought it would be a breakout shield or something. Let's get that out of there. Yep, that's a regular bog standard USB 2.0 PCI card. These always come in handy. And now with that rat's nest of wire out of the way, we can actually read the make and model of this motherboard. An ABIT AN8 Ultra. I just love that it has the built-in postcode displayed down there for much easier troubleshooting. All right, CPU, let's find out who you really are. Wow, that thing's got some serious weight to it. Fan bearing seems perfectly fine. An AMD Opteron? Okay, this thing is just full of surprises. Let's get that rogue zip tie out of there. The Opteron is really for workstations and servers. It's very interesting to see one in a gaming machine. It also happens to be the first CPU to support the AMD 64 instruction set. So this thing is 64-bit. Let's clean that thermal paste off. And now we can finally read the text. Let's pull it out of there. 
Well, we have some thermal paste on the pins there, but at least none of them are bent. Let's get this thing cleaned up properly. There, that's better. And this CPU cooler is a sight to behold. With the exception of the mounting hardware, this thing is basically solid copper. Let's get it cleaned up. Now I guess removing the screw on each side liberates that fan. Let's see how far that gets us. Aha, yes indeed it does. And it's a good thing I did that because this thing is absolutely filthy. All right, those two are looking better. All right, let's see what this glorious thing sounds like. Well, it's definitely not winning any awards for quietness. Most of that might just be because it's on the wooden bench. Yeah, that sounds better. Let's do a quick comparison. Well, maybe a little better. Now let's see what that pretty RAM is all about. And that's a one gig stick of PC3200 DDR1. Even though it says two gigs on there, these were actually sold as a kit made by Patriot, one of the more respected RAM manufacturers of the mid 2000s, at least for home gamers. Let's check out the next one. And that one's an oddball, but it does match in size, speed, and manufacturer. Next. Now these two might be identical to the first stick. And yes, indeed it is. Well, let's see what the last one has. And that one has a broken clip. I'm searching all around inside the case, but I'm not seeing it. Well, that's not good. Let's see if I can still get it out of there. There we go. And that stick is identical to the last one we just looked at. So a total of four gigs of RAM in this thing. That is pretty fancy for the mid to late 2000s. I don't like to look at the discoloration on that CPU socket. I guess that mighty cooler just couldn't keep that Opteron cool enough. Let's get that CPU back in there. Because this thing is dusty. Let's just clean this out the best we can with an anti-static brush. And this thing was either recapped or done right from the start because I'm seeing mostly Rubicon caps on here. This might just be outside of the grip of the capacitor plague. All right, let's get that monster cooler back on. I know you'll be shocked, shocked to know that the battery is completely dead. I know, I can hardly believe it myself. Let's get it replaced. Okay, let's get these drives out of here. And that floppy drive is made by Samsung. And who knows what's been drip dropping on the top of it. Let's see if that'll clean off. Well, that didn't go well. That is most definitely rust. Well, let's give it the usual tune-up anyway. Okay, it's not terribly dirty inside. I see that faceplate clip's just about to let go there. Let's see if we can take that off without wrecking it even further. Let's just go ahead and glue that. Let's clean the rest of this thing out. Those heads are pretty clean. Let's clean and grease that lead screw. A little white lithium grease will cure what ails you. Let's get that faceplate back on. And here's the label for that CD burner slash DVD ROM only drive. And this thing is for really a CD burner slash DVD ROM drive. Honestly, I've never seen anything like that. I've never encountered a burner that was capable of reading a DVD but not capable of burning it. This is too weird. And we got a manufacture date of January 2003. And here's the actual DVD burner made by Sony OptiArc. And this drive is very new compared to most of the stuff on this channel. Manufactured August 2011. Yeah, someone kept this system alive for a while. And the power supply appears to be the newest component I've pulled out of this machine yet. That QA sticker says March 2014. And it's interesting that this thing has two fans. One in the top and one in the back. But it is suspiciously lightweight for something that claims to be 450 watts. I don't think I believe that. Let's give it some stress. Okay, we got sacrificial hard drives. We got light bulbs on the 5 and 12 volt rails. And this one is a 60 watt headlight. Well, let's see what this thing does. And immediate shutdown. Okay, those bulbs might be tripping the short circuit protection. 
So let's go ahead and take them off and see if it starts without them. Nope, not even a blip. I think we might have killed it. Let's just give it a few minutes to discharge. Okay, I gave that thing some time to chill out. Now I've got the smaller light bulb on the 12 volt rail. Let's see what happens now. Okay, we're doing just fine. All the voltages are reasonable. Let's try loading the 5 volt rail and see if it brings the voltage down. Nope, doesn't care. Well, let's just give that five minutes. All right, five minutes is up. The power supply lives. Okay, let's start testing this thing. I'm gonna try booting it up to DOS because that's what I have handy. That'll at least let us test the floppy drive and the IDE CD-ROM drive. It won't do us any good for that SATA drive because no SATA drivers. Oh man, that thing is noisy. Maybe I shouldn't have reconnected all those fans. And we have no post. Well, let's do some investigating. Well, let's see if that postcode display is telling us anything. Let's turn the power supply on. Okay, it's doing something. Now let's try to boot. Yeah, we're getting postcodes. I don't know what any of them mean. And that flickering is only in the camera. I can't actually see that in real life. And this motherboard has red LEDs everywhere. I gotta see this with the shop lights off. Well, I guess the RGB craze started with just R. It even shines through that heat exchanger. Well, I found the manual for this motherboard, and it does contain the postcodes. However, it does not contain the postcode that this system is stopping on. We're stopping at 04 with the decimal places enabled, and the manual makes no mention of that. But I got a speaker connected now, so let's see if it's beeping any codes at us. I better get that video card plugged back in. Let's see. Okay, slow beeping, that means memory error. Well, let's investigate that RAM. Okay, I've dropped it down to one stick, so let's see what we get now. Ah, made it past that postcode. And we're posting. Yeah, I guess one of those RAM sticks are bad. All right, we got a CMOS error, no surprise. Let's try to continue. Oh, that floppy drive sounds terrible. That is definitely the spindle motor. And we did get a read error, so I guess it's not too healthy. We also didn't detect that CD drive. Oh, well, I wonder why that is. Somebody forgot to plug it in. Okay, well, this is strange. I plugged that CD-ROM back in, and now we get no post. And it just sits there blinking. That is some very strange behavior. I know for a fact the cable is installed correctly, but there's no guarantee that cable's any good. So let's try another one. Aha, there we go. And now we see that drive. Let's see if that floppy drive can survive one more boot. Ooh, maybe. Okay, we got a driver now. Okay, let's test it out then. Well, it opens smoothly. And I can barely hear it over the sound of those fans. We'll see what we got. And hey, it works. Finally, a lucky gold star. That's actually what LG stands for. Okay, how about CDRs? And it reads those too. Now obviously I can't test the SATA drive in DOS, but we can at least see if Canopics will boot on it. And it does spin up. Let's get that boot disk out of there. Control Alt Delete. It's really complaining about the CPU frequency. We'll mess with that later. Continue. Okay, Canopics might boot. It's interesting that I detected an NVIDIA sound card. Okay, we made it to the graphical environment. Canopics is fully booted. Let's see if we have 3D acceleration. And yes, we do. No surprise with this being an NVIDIA card. 
They've always been Linux friendly. Okay, it runs DOS, it runs Canopix, but can it run Crisis? Well, let's find out. Okay, I've got a hard drive installed, a 250 gig SATA drive. Now let's get XP installed on there. And by the way, I got all four RAM sticks working now. There was just a dirty edge connector on one or more of them. I just cleaned them all. And now we're at four gigs. But of course, we're installing a 32-bit version of Windows, so we're only going to be able to use three gigs of that. Think that'll be enough for Crisis? And we better finally take a look at the CPU frequency settings. Going to set up. I'm guessing it's in the Micro Guru utility? Yep, sure is. Okay, that is the correct clock speed for this CPU, so I don't know why it's complaining. I guess it just needed me to acknowledge it. Okay, go ahead and save. Yes. Wow, it has been a long time since I've installed Windows XP. Let's get this started. Oh man, does this ever bring back memories. <laughs> Yes, turn on automatic updates. We definitely need those. All right, we are ready to go. Now let's see how many drivers we're missing. Oh, only everything. <laughs> this is gonna take some hunting. Okay, that was easier than I thought. I've got all the drivers loaded, we've got Crisis installed, let's see if we can make this thing explode. Okay, yeah, we can skip this stuff. Okay, let's max this thing out. Now I have to wonder what my capture device can actually handle in terms of resolution. So we're just gonna go full HD. Let's turn anti-aliasing all the way up. I wanna see this thing sweat. And what do we have in advanced? So everything's set to medium. Let's change everything to high. We don't get very high apparently. All right, let's feel the burn. Yes. Okay, I discovered a performance limitation in my capture device. It cannot handle that. So we have to go back to the old school filming of the monitor. Well, let's see what it does. So, funny story. The first time I ever played Crisis, it was on an 8800 GT that I had just bought. And I got about 10 minutes in, and my power supply exploded. <laughs> Imagine that. Yeah, the video card was about all I could afford, so power supply didn't get upgraded. Fortunately, nothing got damaged. So let's see if I get to relive that. Let's do a normal game, because it's been a while. Okay, I'm pretty sure this stuff is pre-rendered. See if we can skip it. Yes. Hey, it's loading pretty fast. All right, let's continue. August 7th, 2020. If only they knew. Okay, we're looking a little laggy. Yeah, I get the feeling the audio is a little ahead of the video. <laughs> okay, it's looking kind of slideshow-ish. Yeah, that's definitely not right. Cool effects, though. Let's try to skip ahead a little bit, get into the actual gameplay. Okay, yeah, I can already tell. That's not going to be very playable. Let's actually go dial back the anti-aliasing. So I'm pretty sure that's the biggest resource drain. Yeah, even the menu is really unresponsive. Let's try 8x. I feel like that'll do it. Okay, well the menu got a lot more responsive. Let's resume. Oh yeah. Okay, listen up, gentlemen. Oh, that's a Intel little better. Significant military presence on the island. Let's get into the actual world. See you guys at the LZ. Oh yeah. 
All right, that's running decently, at least at this altitude. Okay, so far it's pretty playable. Wow, look at that water effect. Honestly, can't believe how well these graphics stand up, even by today's standards. This is pretty crazy. Okay, this is perfectly playable, in my opinion. It's a little bit laggy, but... I've been known to rough it at low FPS, so... To me, this is perfectly playable. At least so far. Uh oh, getting kind of laggy. Aha! No wonder. Took you out. Okay, I know there's more of you. Aha! Got him! Oh, there's more. It has been so long since I've played this game. I don't even know how to crouch or anything. Okay, well, it's a little bit laggy, but not the worst experience in the world. And we are basically at max settings, so I'd say that's a win. Okay, well, I'd say it passes the crisis test. Let's get out of here. And the system survived. Though I do smell some kind of heat coming from somewhere. It's not necessarily that it's burning or something's overheating. It just has that warm old dust smell. All right, let's shut this thing down before we have to call the fire department. Well, even though it couldn't quite hit max settings, I am still thoroughly impressed with how well it did run. This thing is an absolute beast of its time. If it had something like a 9800 GTX, this thing would probably be an unstoppable late 2000s gaming machine. Because I feel like that 9600 GT was right on the edge of running Crisis perfectly. It just needs that little extra oomph. And despite a little bit of noisy floppy drive, everything works in this thing. You can't beat that. I did test the card reader too. That's how I loaded Crisis on it. It worked perfectly fine with an SD card. And it is so cool finally getting to play with some hardware that I used to dream about back then. Let's move on to the next system. The next system is this mystery machine, giving us no badges, no hints, no nothing. We've got a DVD burner up here, 52 speed CD-ROM drive down here, and you guessed it, a floppy drive. I don't know, this case has a simple minimalist style that kind of appeals to me. Just a product of its time. And here's the back of the machine. We've got a warranty sticker there, so this must have been built by somebody who thought highly of themselves. And this motherboard has it all on board, including USB and a NIC onboard video, and onboard sound. We also have some kind of video card there, with S-Video and composite outputs. I'm sure it ain't no 9600 GT. And I love that super thoughtful little handle there for opening the case. So nice of them to consider us like that. All right, let's get this thing open. This case also has a side-mounted fan because of course it does. Wow, that's convenient. Let's see, that fan's not connected. And that is looking Pentium 4-ish. And this machine has had its hard drive removed as well. I guess it's just going to be one of those weeks. Let's go ahead and clear these cables out. Okay, what on earth is going on here? This motherboard has this weird array of headers here. It looks like 5,000 little jumpers. There's no indication on the silk screening of what it actually does. Let's see if I can actually pull one of those jumpers off. Okay, they come off in blocks of 10. Okay, that is just the weirdest thing. Let's go ahead and get that back on. Yeah, this motherboard is a bit of a mystery. I'm not exactly sure who the manufacturer is. The red color makes me think MSI, and the north bridge is marked PC400 or DC400. Not sure, that could go either way. Well, let's check that video card out. Yeah, and that's a bit of a mystery, but cards of this era often are. Looks like an NVIDIA card. Aha, uh -huh, yeah, it's an NVIDIA MX440 with 64 megs of VRAM. You think it can run Crisis? I'm not sure if it would laugh or die. All right, let's see if we have a Pentium 4 or not. 
I always find these coolers pretty nerve-wracking the way they attach. Okay, I'm about 90% sure we're not going to pull the CPU out of its socket. Alright, we made it. Socket 478s are notorious for that. But that thermal pad has seen better days. Let's get that CPU out of there. Okay, everything looks good down here, except for that stupid sticker. Let's get this thing cleaned up. It's always so hard to read these Pentium 4s on camera. But we can see that's an SL5TK. That's a fairly early stepping in the Pentium 4, clocked at 1.7 gigahertz. Let's pick that silly sticker off. And that one would leave residue behind. Alright, that's better. Now let's clean that cooler up. Well, that's as clean as that's getting. There's just something about this thermal compound that just stains aluminum. It's kind of unnerving. Okay, let's see what that fan sounds like. It actually sounds perfect. Alright, so all we have to do is clean that thing up. There, that's better. Okay, let's get that CPU back together. Okay, now it's RAM time. Got a 256 meg stick of DDR1. Single-sided. Let's check out the other one. And that's an identical stick in every way for a total of 512 megs. Very good. And dead battery out. And good battery in. Now let's pull these drives. And that floppy drive is made by Panasonic with a gobbledygook model number. Pretty common little drive. And pretty reliable too. Let's clean it up. Okay, we're minimally dusty. It's not too bad. Geez, that lead screw is dry as a bone. They definitely skimped on the grease in this one. I, however, will not. And here's that creative CD drive, manufactured December 2001. Let's wipe that dust off. And here's that DVD burner, made by Pioneer. Very nice. Okay, so this gives us an idea of the date in which the system was built. So we have those same warranty stickers that we have on the back of the system and the video card. And this drive was made in April 2005. So that puts this machine somewhere in the mid-2000s. Unless those warranty stickers were added by a repair shop or something for some reason. And despite the name, there's nothing extreme about this power supply. Except maybe that it's extremely terrible. This thing is so light that I thought it had been gutted. I gotta take this thing apart and see how cheap it is. And you knew it was coming. The big scary warning. Don't take apart a power supply unless you know what you're doing. Because they'll zap you real good. Even if they've been unplugged for a while. But if it's your first time, just be extremely careful. Yup, looks like tiny land in there. Tiny transformers, tiny capacitors, and tiny heat sinks. All the earmarks of cost cutting. And something got real hot over here. No doubt that MOSFET on that entirely useless heat sink. But other than that, I don't see any other issues. So I don't see any reason why we can't test this thing. Okay, since this thing looks like it's about to explode on its own, we're just gonna hit it with sacrificial hard drives. Let's see what it does. It does absolutely nothing. And that would be due to a blown fuse. Okay, I guess that mark under the MOSFET is actually a burn spot from a short circuit. So this power supply is scrap. Okay, let's do the test thing. Starting with DOS as usual. And we are posting. And we are complaining. Okay, it's just mad about the CMOS battery being dead. And we seem to only have half of our RAM. Let me try to clean up those edge connectors. Now, I use these fiberglass scratch pens to do this, but honestly, you have to be really careful with these. You gotta use a really light touch, because otherwise you could damage the gold plating. A pencil eraser is definitely more gentle, but the scratch pens work so great that I just use them very carefully. There we go. All right, floppy drive's happy enough. Though it does make a little bit of a ticking sound. Okay, let's try out these optical drives. Opens like a champ. And it spins up. Sounds good so far. Let's see. Yep, perfectly fine. Okay, how about the creative drive? Seems a little lazy. 
But it closes in a hurry. Okay, we sound spun up. Let's see. And it works. All right, two happy, healthy optical drives. Okay, let's see if it passes the Canopics test. Let's get that floppy disk out of there. Okay, once to boot, let's go. Okay, booted successfully. Now I still can't find anything on this motherboard. I've been scouring the internet. So let's try to get some info on it. Let's use the LSPCI command. That'll give us a bunch of info on what peripherals this thing has. And this thing is via to the bone. So definitely a cheaper motherboard. The first motherboard I ever bought brand new was based on a VIA chipset, and that's how I know they were cheap, because I was broke. Okay, now I can try to read some DMI strings. We might be able to find a manufacturer in there. We'll use the DMI decode command for that. Let's see what we got. Let's try system manufacturer. ECS. Okay, that doesn't ring a bell to me. Let's try chassis manufacturer. ECS. Okay, what is ECS? Okay, according to the Googles, ECS is better known as Elite Group. That's a name I at least recognize. Okay, well at least I got my answer. Let's see, let's grab that BIOS version, just in case this board needs to be added to the retro web. 7.00T. All right, got that. Let's get the revision too. Okay, that doesn't exist. Okay, that's good enough for me. Let's shut this thing down. Initiating shutdown sequence. Okay, that's weird. I didn't get a startup sound, but I got a shutdown sound. Okay, guess the sound card works. Shut down. Okay, let's try to clean this faceplate up. It's looking real scuffy. Oh, but it cleans right off, thankfully. Okay, that cleaned up incredibly well. Yeah, that motherboard's not very famous at all. I still can't find very much on the internet about it. And that's too bad because I was really hoping to find out what those weird pin headers were next to the RAM slots. It doesn't appear to be on the retro web. In fact, I can't find any socket 478 motherboards made by ECS. So I'll have to get that uploaded as soon as I can. But hey, with the exception of that crappy power supply, this thing's all good. And there is something that I like about this case. I just like its basicness. I doubt I'll keep that motherboard in there though. Let's move on to the next system. And speaking of iconic basicness of the mid 2000s, check this beauty out. Just look how happy that floppy drive looks. It's weird to see a molded floppy drive slot in a custom case. Very curious to see how they're accomplishing that. And we have an especially generic looking 50 speed CD-ROM drive. I guess nobody wanted to put their name on that. And here's a good look at that badge. OS custom built PCs. Even the builder sounds basic. And having a look around the back, we see someone was proud enough of this thing to put a warranty sticker on it. And this thing has two serial ports. That's interesting to see in a time when USB was really starting to take over. And we got some kind of video card here, got a NIC, and I'm guessing the network cable was blue, and some kind of sound card. Okay, let's open this thing up. I just noticed this case has these sporty air intakes on the side here. You think that makes it go faster? That's gotta add at least 20 horsepower. And finally, a system with a hard drive. I was beginning to lose hope. Cool, we might get to do some OS archeology. span Man, this is a pretty tidy little system. It's as dusty as all get out though. I don't see any signs of the capacitor plague. Let's get this stuff disconnected. Let's just shove all that up there for now. And the peripheral cards are retained by this piece of sheet metal here, which is held on with these two screws. Let's get rid of that. Okay, that's weird. Apparently that's just a cover. Those cards still have screws in them. Why would they do it like that? Okay, let's check out that video card. And we've got an AGP S3 Trio. There will be no crisis on this video card. And it's got one of those warranty stickers on it too. Let's hope the manufacturer is not watching. Now let's see that Nick. And got a nice Realtek RTL 8139. That's a very nice compatible Linux friendly chipset. 10100 of course. And I guess original to the system. And there's the MAC address. Now let's check that sound card. Advanced Logic. I can't say I'm familiar with that one. Yeah, that doesn't ring a bell. Now, A Sound Express sounds familiar. Okay. And that motherboard is made by Gigabyte, model GA-5AX, revision 5.2. We got AGP, PCI, and ISA, the retro trifecta. And that's a socket 7 CPU there. 
So that will be either a Pentium 1 or AMD K6 something. Let's get that cooler off. And that is an AMD K6 II, with not a hint of thermal compound anywhere, as was the style at the time, unfortunately. Let's knock that dust off before we take that CPU out of there, because we don't want it falling down in the socket. Now let's pull that thing out of there. And what do you know, another warranty sticker. In contact with the pins, no less. At least all the pins look okay otherwise. Let's get that stupid label off of there. So there's no use in trying to pull that off, because those stickers are designed to fall apart. So let's just go ahead and soak it with IPA. Let it soften the adhesive. And since it's going to leave residue behind anyway, might as well get a jump on cleaning it. Now let's just scrape that thing off. And your warranty is no more. And that's an AMD K62, 500 megahertz, just like the one I used to have back in the day. And that fan seems not great. It's real loose in there. Let's see what it sounds like when it's whirling around. Yeah, not the greatest. In fact, it's getting worse. I don't think oil will help this fan. Gotta see if I have any spares. Okay, either I don't have a replacement fan or I can't find it. So we're gonna have to see what we can do for this one. I've already got all the dust removed because we need to get into that bearing and oil it. And we don't want to make matters worse by knocking dust in there. And that label's actually already compromised, so that might be a moot point. Yeah, things mostly off there anyway. Yeah, that is one contaminated bearing. I'm actually gonna flush it with IPA first. Just to help break up some of that gunk. Okay, that's had plenty of time to dry. Let's give it some oil. Now we'll run it to let it work in. Okay, we're starting to sound better. I guess this thing was salvageable after all. Now let's wipe up that excess oil. IPA does the trick. Now I'm gonna seal it up the best I can with Kapton tape, but there isn't very much meat there between the circuit board and the bearing. Good enough. Now let's sweep that heat sink out. Okay, that thing's doing a lot better than I thought it would. Okay, let's get that CPU back in and dressed for success. Now let's see what we have for RAM. And that's a 128 meg stick of PC-133 from good old Canada. Single-sided and apparently original to the system. And that's all the RAM we get. And this is almost unbelievable, but that battery's not completely dead. That's still enough to hold settings. So we're just gonna leave that alone for now. All right, let's get that hard drive out of there. Man, that thing is fuzzy. It's just covered in dust. Let's wipe that off. And there's a Samsung spin point, 10.2 gigabytes. We've got that warranty sticker there, so it must have come with the system. And it was manufactured May 2000. So I guess this is an early 2000s machine. That's interesting. And I just pulled the floppy drive, fully expecting it to be some kind of faceless monstrosity. And it's just a regular old three and a half inch floppy drive. That is a really interesting case design. That means this button doesn't have any spring back action of its own. Yeah, sure doesn't. <laughs> it just floats around in there. It depends on the floppy drive to push it out. And that floppy drive is made by Alps with an IBM FRU number. That's awfully strange because this most likely is original to the system because it has that stupid warranty sticker on it. Was this builder scavenging parts? Or maybe they came across a large stock of IBM parts. Well, let's get this thing cleaned up. Well, despite outward appearances, it's actually pretty clean in here. I guess there's some merit to that molded faceplate. That was one dirty lead screw. This drive actually has several grease points, like in this slider release mechanism. There's also a spot where the head rides against this piece of metal here. Let's take it for a test drive. Works great. Okay, whoever manufactured this CD-ROM drive really wanted to disown it. I don't see a manufacturer's name anywhere. All I see is this manufacturer number, which Google knows nothing about. That model number doesn't lead me very far. This thing's a bit of a mystery. 
but it was manufactured November 1999, and it's fuzzy. It does have some decent weight to it, so it can't be too terrible a quality. However, I cannot say the same for the power supply. That thing is light as a feather. It's even lighter than the last one. And in my experience, weight is a pretty good indicator of a power supply's quality. And this thing ain't got it. Let's open it up and see how bad it is. And I was just spinning it around and apparently there's something rattling around in there. Sounds conductive. Oh, ho we got some carnage. This thing exploded good and proper. That stuff rattling around is actually capacitors or used to be capacitors. And there's a former capacitor right there next to that heat sink. And look at that huge burn spot on the PCB. Looks like that resistor turned into a heating element. Let's snip these wires out of here. Looks like this thing was actually on fire for a couple of seconds. And here's some more capacitor carnage. Looks like that one vented. And here's the label from one of those that was rattling around in there. Well, it's too bad we didn't get to see it. That must have been spectacular. And what's crazy is these capacitors didn't even bother to vent. They just grenaded. And this one just rocketed clean off its base. See, it's actually hollow in there. A fitting end to what was obviously a junky power supply anyway. Let's just hope the rest of the system survived that. See, this is why I always test these things first. The surrogate power supply is certainly earning its keep this week. Let's see what this thing does. Well, it doesn't do much. That's not a good sign, considering how badly that power supply exploded. All right, let's do some investigating. Okay, I disconnected all the drives, removed all the peripheral cards except for the video card. We got the post analyzer card in there. Let's see what we get. And they got nothing on the post analyzer card. I'm sure an award BIOS would be setting postcodes, so that could mean the CPU is not running code. Okay, well, things are getting warm like they're supposed to. The video card and the north bridge are getting warm. And even the CPU is a little warm, so it's definitely getting power. Yeah! Okay, the south bridge is burning hot. Yeah, that's not normal. That thing's getting up over 200 degrees. Well, that could mean that thing's internally shorted. Let's go ahead and shut this thing down. Well, that could mean curtains for this motherboard. Let's actually go ahead and pull this motherboard out. Let's get that front panel disconnected. And check this out. This case has a removable motherboard tray. Now that is especially unique on an ATX system. The I.O. plate's held on with two screws. So let's get that off there. Now it looks like we have three screws. Two on the top and one on the bottom. Let's get those out. Okay, now... I feel like it should slide back. Yeah, there we go. Yeah, check that out. I just love stuff like that. Okay, every single component on this board looks absolutely perfect. I don't see any signs of damage anywhere. But unfortunately, that doesn't mean there's not internal damage to some of those ICs particularly our south bridge. Yeah, this thing's most likely done for. Unless I can find a replacement south bridge, but then there's no telling what else on this board is damaged. And you know what else I find awfully ominous? We didn't hear a single peep out of any of those drives. Let's try testing those individually. And this three and a half inch drive cage is also removable. This case is really starting to grow on me. Look at this, it even has these ultra convenient finger holes for carrying. They even rolled over the sheet metal so you don't get cut. I love this case. Okay, let's try the hard drive. And we get absolutely nothing. It doesn't even try to spin up. Oh man, that hurts. Maybe if I give it a little whack. Nah, that thing's dead. And apparently it's sending a distress signal. See the LED there? It's blinking some kind of error code. None of these chips feel hot. In fact, nothing on the board feels hot. Just a little warm. Well, it's curtains for this one, I guess. Okay, how about the CD drive? Yeah, that's acting pretty dead, too. Let's see if it opens. Nope. 
completely dead. Wow, that power supply might have taken out everything. And to test the floppy drive, I'm going to enlist the help of my little compact desk pro. This thing is just so easy to take apart. It's the perfect platform for testing things like this. Had to use a different floppy cable, because the one in the compact has that pin blocked off. All right, let's see. Hey, at least it gets power. That's more than the other drives are doing. And it's booting DOS. Oh, I'm so glad the Alps drive survived. Yeah, that makes me feel better. We got one survivor. Okay, I've got that video card, CPU, and RAM swapped into a random Socket 7 system. So we're gonna test them all at once. Let's see what we get. Okay, that means the video card's not happy, so it's most likely dead. But that might be a good sign for the CPU. Let's get a known good video card in there. Okay, the known good video card is in. Let's see what we get now. All right, single beep. And we're posting. Okay, so at least the CPU and RAM lived. Well, it's amazing what kind of carnage a failed power supply can cause. Yeah, that one hurt. But at least we got a nifty case and a handful of good parts out of the deal. I'm gonna keep an eye out for a south bridge for that motherboard. It's been a while since I've done any BGA soldering, so that'll be a fun little project. But if I can't, rest in peace, Gigabyte. I almost feel like we should have a funeral for this Gigabyte board. Can't save them all, I guess. And as always, thank you so much to all the supporters of the channel for keeping me online. And if you're new here, I have quite a few videos like this now, so be sure to check those out. But that's all for this one. Thanks for watching.